To all of the 350 people that signed up for this lecture, good morning and welcome. My name is David Andreozzi. I'm an architect and the president of the New England chapter of the ICAA, the Institute of Classical Architecture and Art. We are here today to welcome renowned landscape historian, Judith Tankard, to discuss the gardens of and the descendants gardens of the golden arts and crafts era of the early 20th century. Before we start, those of you who are new to the ICA today, we are a leading nonprofit organization committed to promoting and preserving the practice, understanding, and appreciation of the classical tradition in architecture, urbanism, and the allied arts. The Institute, our mothership, is located in New York City with 16 chapters across the United States. Nationally, the ICA offers a broad range of educational programs, including intensives for architecture and design students, introductory programs for middle school students, lectures and walking tours for the public, continuing education courses for public for professionals and enthusiasts, travel programs to visit classical masterpieces, the publishing of original and reprinted books, an annual journal entitled The Classicist. In addition, regionally, we provide education and working tours. We also have the Bullfinch Awards, our New England chapter at the Harvard Club in Boston. There we honor New England's best accomplishments in the traditional and classical architecture, landscape architecture, interior design, and the allied arts. Because of COVID, this year's laureates will have to wait a bit and be honored next year as we'll be combining them together, God willing, in the fall. For those of you with work completed in New England, except for Fairfield County, please go to our website and consider submitting for a 2021 Bullfinch Honor. Before we proceed, there will be a question and answer session immediately after the lecture. If you have any questions, write them down in the Q&A window by choosing the button on the screen, and we'll try to answer as many as we can, depending on how many we get. Judith Tankard is a landscape historian, award-winning author, and preservation consultant. She is an author of 10 illustrated books, including Ellen Shipman and the American Garden, winning, winner of the 2019 J.B. Jackson Book Award. Her book, Beatrice Farron, Private Gardens, Public Landscapes, was named an honor book for the 2010 Historic New England Book Prize. She taught at the Landscape Institute of Harvard University for 20 years. Judith is a Garden Conservancy Fellow, a Heritage Circle member of the Royal Oak Foundation, and a Stewardship Council member of the Cultural Landscape Foundation. She lives in Boston and gardens in Martha's Vineyard. Judith, thank you very much for joining us. So you can, will you share, can you share a screen? There we go. Well, it's a pleasure to be here today and greetings from Boston's Back Bay. It's a nice okay. cloudy day and a good time to be inside dreaming about what gardens we're going to all be visiting next year. Well, my romance with the arts and crafts movement began well over 50 excuse, years. Judith, excuse me. I'm sorry, yeah. the, the screen is not shared yet. So um, that, that there should I be- I did hit screen share. Okay, let's just, um, the, the green button on the bottom screen share. Try that one more time.
Maybe I need to back out of the PowerPoint. It's not that to, that bar isn't there. Uh, so you're looking on the Zoom, the Zoom webinar panel itself at the bottom? Uh, I have the uh, PowerPoint up and looking at the first slide. Okay, so let's um, back out of that, minimize that screen on the upper right. Yeah, it doesn't do any, I'm going to have to uh, back out, back out and start over again. Sorry. That's okay. Okay, I hit screen share, share. Perfect. Oh, we left out that one step, okay. <laughs> now I need to go to my files. Okay, we're ready to roll. <laughs> awesome. Okay, great. Well, my romance with the arts and crafts movement began well over 50 years ago when as a graduate student in art history at New York University, I visited a place called Standen, which is uh, Philip Webb's extraordinary house in West Sussex, and now an arts and crafts mecca for architects, interior designers, and gardeners alike. Today, Standen has uh, Morris and Company furnishings, extensive gardens, and a magnificent setting. But back in the late 1960s, it was still privately owned by the original family before being transferred to the National Trust in 1973. Later on, I learned that the arts and crafts movement championed the unity of art art, architecture, interior design, and gardens were considered as a whole and not isolated entities. It's important to remember about the arts and crafts movement. It's not a style, but it's really a philosophical approach to design with individual expressions and its guiding principles were simplicity and reverence for local traditions and materials. Well, actually the movement itself was pretty short lived basically from in Britain, basically from the 1880s uh, until it fell out of favor after World War I. But it left a large design legacy that still resonates today in Britain, the United States, and also in Europe. The arts and crafts movement actually offers something for everyone from architecture, interiors, and gardens, to ceramics, textiles, wallpapers, jewelry, metalwork, and much more. Well, William Morris quickly became one of my heroes. His famous house, Red House, his, his famous home, Red House, which was also designed by Philip Webb, was built in 1859. At the time, it was unlike any house before. It was steeped in medievalism had unusual whitewashed interiors and it was surrounded by gardens and beautiful meadows. But even though William Morris extolled flowers in his designs and throughout his writing, it is doubt one of his biographers said that it's doubtful that he ever held a garden spade. We're looking at a real time picture of Red House, which is a National Trust property today. And on the left, a period painting showing the romantic quality. Well, his garden, of course, inspired, provided inspiration for the firm's many famous wallpapers, fabrics, and tapestries. And its very first uh, pattern is called the trellis, designed in 1864. It was designed in collaboration, a collaboration between Morris and his great friend, of course, Philip Webb who drew the birds, and you can see that pattern on the left. Morris and Company wallpapers and fabrics depicting flowers are still in, in production today, as many of us know. One of his most famous, Blackthorn, was designed in 1892. Well, William Morris later moved to Kelmscott Manor 
outside of Oxford. And it was a rambling medieval manor house with much more rooms and a red house and had, he proceeded to design and create enchanting gardens that were depicted in one of his books. As you can see on the cover of News from Nowhere in 1892. And also on the right, a, roman a romantic painting that shows it pretty much the way it is today. It is filled with, this, if you haven't been to this, you must put it on your must, must visit list. Uh, it's filled to the hilt with Morris and Company furnishings and the gardens, the beautiful gardens brim with flowers. It's not part of the National Trust, but it's managed, been managed for many, many decades by the Society of Antiquaries. Well, William Morris inspired others to take up the call for traditional building and handicrafts as a respite from life in smoke-filled industrial cities. And the most famous were the architects, Ernest Jimson and the Barnsley brothers, who moved to the Cotswolds to set up furniture workshops. They used the local limestone to build their individual houses. We all know how beautiful the Cotswold stone is. Um, the one we're showing on the screen is, is designed by Ernest Barnsley and it's called U Upper Dorval House, a, very, a private house with this wonderful tiny enclosed garden in Sapperton Village. Well, Sydney Barnsley's fan fanciful uh, dovecoat at Beach Hanger that you can see on the left, and also Jimson's dovecote uh, that you can see on the right are wonderful examples of uh, whimsical buildings uh, using the local limestone. Well, the group completed uh, a number of building uh, commissions in the area in addition to designing their own homes. Uh, including one called Cotswold Farm, which today is a private house with a simple terrace garden that was laid out by Norman Jewson, and also this quintessential garden house that you can see on the right. And these were features that soon became part of the arts and crafts vocabulary in the Cotswolds. So in addition to building new houses in the old style, they also renovated old manor houses and probably one of the most famous is Alpen Manor with its garden that's enclosed by ancient yews. The plan that you can see on the left shows the intimacy of house and garden where the garden functions actually as an outdoor room. Today it's privately owned by a family but their accommodations are available. I stayed there once with a group and we had a wonderful time. Well, Rothmartin Manor, however, is probably the most famous of all the arts and crafts houses and gardens to be built during the era. It was designed by Ernest Barnsley and it was built over a 20 year period. And it has this extraordinary garden. The house itself is completely outfitted with locally made furniture, metalwork and tapestries. Every single thing in the house was handmade for this particular house. And it took, as I said, over 20 years to build it. The plan that you can see on the left shows how the house was surrounded by numerous garden rooms, such as the one, the one closest to the house called the Winter Garden. And two more views, the long double borders, and then the topiary terrace was part of it also. The garden itself was inspired by um, a book by John Setting that was published in 1890 called Garden Craft Old and New. It's often re regarded as the Bible of garden design of the era. And interesting enough, uh, Rod Martin is still owned by the same family, the Biddall family, and it's frequently open to the public. Well, word soon spread about the Cotswolds inspiring younger generation of architects to take up their ideas in other parts of England. So in the mid 1920s, we have Oswald Milne, a young, uh, a young and upcoming architect who designed uh, this beautiful house and garden called Colton Fishacre in Devon. 
was a summer home for the uh, famous Doyle Card family. Built entirely of local materials, the project includes an informal stone terraces, uh, several remarkable water features, like such as the one that you can see on the right, a fish pond that's on the upper terrace. And these all were many, much copied features of the arts and crafts uh, garden era. It is surrounded by acres and acres of naturalistic woodland gardens that lead down to the sea. And of course, it goes without saying, it's one of the treasures of the, of the National Trust and is open to the public. So where did the idea of the arts and crafts design philosophy come from? So in the 1880s, Britain began emerging from the heavy shroud of Victorian architecture to be replaced by more intimate houses that were designed by other architects such as Richard Norman Shaw. The Shaw inspired suburban villa, which is depicted in Kate Greenaway's children's book, really encapsulates this new approach to design. Here we have the hedge enclosed gardens. And of course, if you look carefully, the essential Morrison Company side chairs. The era also rediscovered the so-called old fashioned garden that appealed to many period artists, most famous of whom was George Elgood, uh, whose book, Some English Gardens that he wrote with Gertrude Jekyll in 1906, championed what we call old fashioned cottage gardens such as Cleve Pryor that you can see on the left, a perfect example of this type of period garden. So as setting said in his, his book, the old fashioned garden represents one of the pleasures of England and the quiet life of bygone times. These gardens are beautiful yesterday, today, and beautiful always. So we do well to turn to them. And this is the important part, not to replicate them, but to glean hints for our gardens today and quote unquote, drink of their spirit. And it's still good advice today. On the right, a perfect example of one of these gardens, this is Lights Carry, which is a yet another uh, National Trust property open to the public. Well, Inigo Triggs was one of several young architects who studied the, the simple layouts of older gardens with their distinctive architectural features and detailing that really informed the arts and crafts garden and his lavish folio book called Formal Gardens of England and Scotland, which was published in 1902, included measured drawings of older gardens such as uh, Montague's house in uh, Somerset. Garden pavilions and other features inspired architects and garden architects to replicate them in new gardens. And here we have two examples. One, the Triggs original illustration of Montague's house and what it looks like uh, today. And once again, a National Trust property. Well, topiary, or uh, popularly known as fanciful clipped hedges, became somehow became one of the key features of the arts and crafts garden, whatever their size. And such as these, the most famous ones that we're looking at on the right at Levin's Hall, shown in Elgood's painting at the top and what it looked like today. Each one of the houses had their own distinctive um, topiary and you can see the one for Levin's Hall in the middle of Inigo Triggs drawing. Now Walter Crane's picture book was published <coughs> was published in 1899 and it depicted the essential vocabulary for these new gardens including of course uh, topiaries, peacocks, garden gates and wonderful potted plants. Now I'm sure most of you will recognize these pictures. Hidcott Manor, it combines <coughs> all the features of arts and crafts garden making, 
It was created by Lawrence Johnstone over many, many years, beginning in 1912, and modeled primarily on period books, as well as Johnson's expertise and his extensive world travels. For, for those who are not familiar with it, it has over a dozen what we call garden rooms, such as the topiary garden with the birds that you can see on the left and the white cottage garden on the right. And the white garden many years later inspired Vita Sackville West to do her own white garden at Sissinghurst. Our two more views of Hidcott, famous for its color themes, such as the red border on the left and the red border meant not red flowers, but red and maroon colored foliage. And these inspired many, many uh, legions of many uh, subsequent garden makers. On the right, the stilt garden. Well, arts and crafts gardens are generally not nearly as elaborate and complex as Hidcott, and instead focus on simple structuring, well-crafted details, medieval inspired imagery, once again, such as topiary but above all else, a harmonious relationship with the house and the garden together. So founded in 1893, the studio magazine focused on this new aesthetic. It had beautiful line drawings and color renderings of houses and gardens and decorative arts. Some of which such as the one we're seeing on the right called High Moss, which did in fact get built uh, were a bit unrealistic. The magazine also featured the work of young and upcoming architects such as Charles Rennie McIntosh, GFA Boise, Bailey Scott, and several others who brought their own viewpoints to the movement. And the cover of the first issue was designed by the British architect GFA Boise, Use and Beauty. Well, Macintosh obviously is very hard to slot into the arts and crafts movement since he, his vocabulary is so distinctive, but it's worth mentioning Hill House where he not only designed a revolutionary house, but all the, and all the furnishings on the interior from furniture to metalwork and deco and all sorts of decorative arts, but he also uh, designed the garden, which was kept extremely simple. It was uh, a framework for the house. But his love of flowers were expressed later on uh, at the end of his life when he did beautiful watercolors. Well, probably one of the most in, in the innovative architects working at the period uh, was uh, CFA Boise, who is known for his whitewashed houses such as Broadleys on Lake Windermere, which is now today a private yacht club. This was an era when most architects like Boise and McIntosh, Bailey Scott, whom we'll hear more about, and Lutyens, for example, all designed everything for their clients from furnishings to the gardens. Boise's image, vision, um, sorry, uh, rendering uh, was published uh, in the studio magazine shows a typical uh, whitewashed Boise house with a simple but uh, imaginative garden to go with it. His vision for one of, uh, for another one of his houses is called Ropes and Ballads uh, includes an imaginary meadow and flower garden together with everything in bloom at once. And red flowers, you know, preponderance of red flowers and the flower border were actually there to match the color of the roof and the red curtains that were one of, in the windows, which were always one of Boise's signatures. Boise, however, is better known for his enchanting wallpapers and fabrics that he designed when his short architectural career was over a nursery fabric from the 1930s that you can see on the left, the house that Jack built, depicts one of his own houses surrounded by an imaginary garden of Eden with birds and flowers. 
And then on the right, another wonderful one of uh, Boise's wallpapers and fabric designs with peacocks and the sundial that was part of the standard vocabulary for an arts and crafts garden. Well, Bailey Scott, whom I mentioned a couple of times, is another creative architect of the era. He was also an artist and he was associated, very, very much associated with the arts and crafts movement. His renderings, such as this garden pergola that we can see on the right, uh, regularly appeared in the studio magazine. And also he wrote a, a, a wonderful book that's well worth uh, searching for called Houses and Gardens in which he actually comments on garden design and the importance of it. So Blackwell, which is located in uh, near Lake Windermere and is now a, uh, a major arts and crafts museum, is probably his most famous remaining house. Although the parterre garden that was there has long since vanished. And the interiors are filled with decorative art such as wall coverings and a fire dog, all of which had these wonderful floral motifs. So he really was bringing the house, the garden into the house. Well, Bailey Scott's garden at Snows Hill Manor, uh, another major national trust property, is an excellent example of the new courtyards that he designed it linked the old rambling manor house with the ancient farm buildings, including a medieval dovecote that you can see in the right, all on extremely sloping ground. Several of the rooms include, uh, include the well court that you can see on the left and then the right, the romantic armillary court um, it, he wasn't that much into doing flower borders, but he was more good. He was more uh, attuned to designing the garden rooms with all the appropriate architectural accoutrements. And now probably the most famous design team of the arts and crafts era, Gertrude Jekyll, whom we'll hear more about a little later and the architect Edwin Lutyens. Their collaboration in the early 1900s produced some of the most best examples of arts and crafts houses and gardens, most of which were featured in Country Life magazine and were well known at the time. Marsh Court in Hampshire, which is seen in these original Country Life pictures, um, was built from, built from white chalk. with red tile and black flint detailing. The gardens hugging the house include a sunken water garden that you can see on the left, flanked by borders and below that a pergola and a pool. And all of these would become standard Lutyens and Jekyll features. Uh, the garden was, the property was a, a boys school for many, many decades and now it's in private hands and the gardens were completely rehabilitated by uh, Reed Hildebrand landscape architects. Lutyens, who obviously excelled in clever details, extended the checkerboard theme on the face of the house to the paving and even to this quaint arts and crafts sundial, a very common feature of the arts and crafts garden. However, it's probably Folly Farm. It's, it's their best known and most ambitious project. And this one was carried out between 1902 and 1912. And here they, they created a series of hedged rooms, including a canal garden that you can see in the upper left in the original country, country life photo. And then on the right, as it appears today, the gardens such as the canal garden were all recently restored by uh, Dan Pearson studio. Here we have the so-called Gertrude Jekyll so-called blue and purple parterre garden. Everything in it was either blue or purple. Once again, the original country life picture on the left and then Dan Pearson's uh, uh, restoration on the right. 
And the final a picture of Fowley Farm, here you have the loja in the original country life picture and then what it looks like today. Fowley Farm is still privately owned, but it's occasionally open to the public through the Legends Trust or National Garden Scheme Open Day. However, Hesterkloom Garden in Somerset is probably one of the most, the team's most visible gardens. It was a large classical garden, but filled with arts and crafts details. Unfortunately, no Lutchen's house to go with it, only a homely Victorian mansion. Here we're standing with our back to the mansion, to the mansion and looking out over the great plat. It's in a, as I'm sure many of you visited this and didn't know about it, but you would understand that it's a an elaborate water garden with rills, two matching rills, and magical plantings by Gertrude Jekyll. But also the magic is in Lutchen's details for the pools that were very much copied by many other architects of the era. The grotto on the left and the uh, elevated pool garden and the rotunda on the right. And of course, Gertrude Jekyll's artful planting in enhances Lutchen's architectural elements. And here we have this beautiful picture of what it looks like today with Gertrude Jekyll style plantings and the beautiful stone walls that were built. And the pergola, probably one of the best of all of the pergolas that Lutchen's designed. If you look at it carefully, you can note that uh, they're alternating round and square piers and they were covered, as you can see, with Gertrude Jekyll's famous um, favorite climbers. Hester Coombe is open to the public at all times, and it is one of my favorite gardens. I love to go visit it and see all the details in the planting. And then at Great Dixter, of course, the Lloyd family's famous garden in Sussex, Lutchens remodeled the buildings and defined the grounds. And here we have a picture of Christopher Lloyd's famous long border. But it's Lutchen's distinctive paths and steps and arches and all these architectural features that give order to the garden areas, which had once been a homely farm. Each area is linked from, from one to the other. Well, the arts and crafts approach to design quickly spread beyond the the borders to Scotland and Wales. And then Robert Lorimer, who was a contemporary of Lutchen's, planned extensive gardens, new gardens at, a, at an old uh, manor house called Earl's Hall, a 16th century castle in Fife that's shown on the left in uh, a plan, you know, yet another plan from Inigo Triggs' book. And rumor has it that he planted fully grown topiaries to give the garden a mature look. He also laid out a smaller, less complex walled garden at Kelly Castle. Um, and this is a National Trust for Scotland property that evokes an earlier era. And here we have dense flower borders, but lots of period ornaments such as the armillary sphere that decorate the garden. As you can see in the original, uh, painting by George Elgood, and then a photograph taken a number of years ago to show what the garden looks like. Lorimer thought that a garden should be in tune with the house, as he said in his book, a sort of sanctuary where one could shut oneself off from the world. H.A. Tipping, who was architectural editor of Country Life for many years, uh, featured many of these new houses and gardens. The magazine featured many of these houses and gardens, but for himself, he brought the arts, arts and crafts approach to design to Wales. In a series of three houses and gardens that he designed, the last one of which is High Glenow, which, he, which was designed in the 1920s, now impeccably restored and open to the public. Nearby Wincliffe Court, 
here he designed a classic arts and crafts garden consisting, you can recognize all the features now, a small sunken garden, topiary, water features, and of course, a beautiful garden pavilion built from the local stone. And then at Place Fondano, that was the home of the, really the last of the arts and crafts architects. This is Clus William Zellis. Um, he took up the cause rather late in the period. He was an artist by nature, but he was also fascinated by rural architectural traditions. Located on the coast of Snowdonia in Wales, he designed a garden of rooms surrounded, surrounding his old family homestead called Plas Brandano. Although it comes late in the game, it is definitely arts and crafts in spirit and a beautiful site. And here are a couple of vignettes of what the garden looks like today. A topiary garden, of course, on the left uh, in front of the orangery. And then on the right, one of uh, a pool garden with uh, hydrangeas open to the public. And now a word from the arts and crafts, artist gardeners who made the arts and crafts garden a reality. And of course, we're talking about William Robinson and Gertrude Jekyll. They were both near contemporaries, although he got his start much earlier in the 1870s when he started writing books, including a famous one called The, the Wild Garden, which promoted the use of native rather than exotic bedding out plants in English gardens. His home, of course, was Gravetime Manor, was Elizabethan in origin and at one time surrounded during Robinson era, surrounded by over a thousand acres of bucolic fields and woodlands. Today, I'm sure many of you know, it's a luxury hotel and the gardens have been recently rejuvenated by Tom Coward. Well, Robinson in himself is important because he was, a, he was really the writer who provided the essential horticultural element, which was, which he thought was missing from architect's gardens, which he absolutely despised, as well as topiary, which he considered, which he considered in one of his books he called vegetable sculpture. A period painting of the house and garden as it appeared in William Robinson's day. Uh, by an artist named Alfred Parsons, who himself was also a garden designer. So like Munstead Wood, many artists came to Grave Tide to paint the, the gardens. Parsons, um, as I said, was a garden designer and his work, his work can be seen at Great Shalfield Manor and Whittock Manor, both of the National Trust properties. Another artist, Beatrice Parsons, no relation with Alfred, famously painted Grave Tide Summer Borders, which appears on the cover of my book. And then also these magnificent woodland gardens. For some reason, Beatrice Parsons was also called the queen of the blazing border. And now Munstead Wood. And obviously Gertrude Jekyll needs no introduction to this audience. Uh, she was an artist by training, and she was in fact the one woman arts and crafts movement. She was a painter, an embroiderer, metal worker, woodworker, photographer, and much, much more before she even turned to gardening and writing in midlife. Munstead Wood, of course, was built in 1896, and it set off her collaboration with Lutchens with designing houses and gardens known the world over. But at heart, she was a plant lover and Munstead Wood was filled with seasonal gardens and borders. Such as her color theme, 200 foot long June border, which you can see a portion of on the left, one of the many garden pictures that she created at Munstead Wood, a painting by Helen Allingham. And then on the right, a rare color photograph, an autochrome from the Country Life uh, library showing what the garden looked like in her era. Two more vignettes of her famous Michaelmas Daisy borders, which you can see in Helen Allingham's uh, period painting on the upper left. And then the garden, 
the borders as they were replanted a number of years ago. Munstead Wood is open to the, is still privately owned and is occasionally open to the public. And probably one of Gertrude Jekyll's best known gardens is the impeccably restored manor house at Upton Gray, which is located in Hampshire. Originally designed for the owner of the studio magazine, it is now, it is a garden of rooms featuring a parterre garden that you can see with low stone walls and lush, luscious roses. The present owner followed planting plans that she obtained from Gertrude Jekyll's archives, which are at the University of California at Berkeley. And she perfectly managed to emulate Gertrude Jekyll's uh, magical style. Manor House at Upton Gray is open to the public uh, in May and June, and it's well worth a detour to see the beautiful plantings here. Well, moving right along here, um, the person who actually combined horticulture and design expertise all in one, one veil was Thomas Mawson. He was the one who brought landscape design into the professional realm in the early 1900s. And his family owned a, uh, a nursery in the Lake District. And after learning drafting schools, he launched his landscape design career. He spread the word about the profession of landscape architecture in his very popular book, The Art and Craft of Garden Making, which went through five different editions, but was originally published in 1900. He said in his memoirs that he wrote this book to educate his clients, to let them know what the possibilities were that they could be using. It, this book actually turned out to be as important as Gertrude Jekyll's Gardens for Small Country Houses that uh, she was a co-author of in 1912. In this beautiful book, he included professional plans, plus these incredible, uh, plus many photographs, but also these beautiful watercolor renderings that illustrated all his points. It's still probably the best period book uh, about the arts and grass garden. Well, most of his work was carried out in the Lake District, but not exclusively. Langdale Chase, which today is a, a hotel and the gardens of now uh, is the Garden of Shrubs. But another property that he designed early in his career, Gracewaite Hall. He, he laid out the landscape with many drives and woodland gardens and also included this rare topiary garden. And then finally, different gardens in Wales. This is another National Trust property. Um, it's probably one of Mawson's most famous and most visible uh, commissions today. People can visit this garden. It's the Garden of Rooms. Many of them have been under restoration and the garden is well worth a de detour to visit. Well, the message of the English arts and crafts approach to design was highly influential around the world, especially in the United States, where it actually took on regional identities and focused more on architecture and decorative arts rather than garden design. And probably its most lasting contribution was in architecture and crafts such as ceramics, metalwork, furniture, as well as the establishment of arts and crafts communities and societies uh, such as Albert Hubbard's Roy Crofters in East Aurora, New York, and here Gustav Stickley's Craftsman Farm in New Jersey. Stickley, who for better or worse is often regarded as the American William Morris, was influential on middle-class Americans, offering them home building and garden making advice through his wonderful publication called The Craftsman. And here he promoted natural gardens as opposed to, quote, rich man's gardens that were ostentatious. Well, in Short Hills, New Jersey, little known architect William Wenton Renwick, who was a nephew of James Renwick, created a seminal house and garden in the 1920s that was then called Pleasant Days, which we're seeing in this uh, original hand-colored uh, 
slide with acres of design grounds, including the so-called Garden of the Gods, with pool and statuary shown in this vintage photo. The house is now gone, but the extensive gardens remain, including Renwick's beautiful uh, rustic stone built tea houses, like the two on the property that are decorated on the roof and on the floor with rookwood tiles. Today, the property is known as Greenwood Gardens, the preservation project of the Garden Conservancy. It's an extraordinary arts and crafts garden tucked away in Short Hills, New Jersey. It has nature trails and currently uh, open to the public. Well, young American architects were often swept away by their English contemporaries whose work they learned about through books and magazines that heralded the new style. And this is all in opposition to the large Gilded Age mansions that were being built or had just been built. And Chicago, of course, was the hotbed of the arts and crafts movement. Uh, from the formation of the Chicago Arts and Crafts Society in 1897 to individual architects such as Frank Lloyd Wright. However, Howard Van Doren Shaw, who was a local architect, he did design country houses in, on the North Shore of Chicago in Lake Forest, was a devoted follower of the British Arts and Crafts Movement and his own house called Ragdale, built in 1897. Um, strongly resembles the Boise House. Today, Ragdale is a writer's retreat. It, was it should be said that it was originally uh, surrounded, the whole property at north of Chicago was originally surrounded by apple orchards and meadows, harking back to William Morris's Red House on the right. Uh, in a small kitchen garden, there's a grape arbor, wellhead, sundial, and of course, this wonderful English-inspired dove coat. And in California, obviously, the arts and crafts movement took on a distinctive regional identity with the Green and Green brothers, who were, incredibly enough, exact contemporaries of the Barnsley brothers in England. And in California, they established themselves as preeminent architects specializing in so-called bungalow style houses with exquisite furnishings. And probably one of their most famous projects is the Gamble House with its garden inspired decorative motifs. And in Woodside, California, Charles Sumner Green designed Green Gables in 1911 with its extraordinary water garden now considered the largest garden in the country designed by an arts and crafts architect. Rustic stonework is carried out in the paths and planters. Green Gables, which was a former, former preservation project of the Garden Conservancy uh, was recently on the market. I don't know any of the details of whether someone has Bought it. it was originally designed for the Flyshark family. And then American regionalism in the arts and crafts movement comes into play in, on the East Coast in the form of art colonies featuring the so-called old fashioned gardens. And here we have the home and studio of the American sculptor Augusta St. Garden in Cornish, New Hampshire. It's a prime example of this attitude, a simple parterre filled with traditional New England plants. And then the artist Stephen Parrish's garden, also in Cornish, shown in the artist's own painting on the left and a period image on the right, uh, showing his niece walking amongst the hollyhocks. And the Lyme art colony in Old Lyme, Connecticut today, the called the Florence Griswold Museum, is the oldest uh, colony, uh, artist colony in the United States. And in its day, it attracted Child Hassan and other important artists. And these so-called old fashioned gardens represent yet another arm of the influential arts and crafts movement. And then topiary sometimes found it 
whimsical expression in some American gardens. And here's probably one of the most famous one is a famous topiary hunt at Ledoux Gardens in uh, Maryland. Well, I'd like now to, in conclusion, to, to turn to some of the new gardens that have been inspired by the arts and crafts movement and also to show how the concept of the harmonious housing garden continues to influence today's garden designers on both sides of the pond. In the gardens at Great Fosters in Surrey were laid out in 1918 and they included an immaculate topiary and knot garden as well as a rose archery that you can see on the right. Today, Great Fosters is a luxury hotel uh, not 20 minutes from uh, Heathrow Airport. The gardens have been rigorously maintained over the years, including a recent update by uh, the renowned uh, British landscape architect, Kim Welke, who added new areas as well as preserved all the original old gardens. And then Roy Strong's uh, famous garden, the Lasket on the Welsh borders, it's probably one of the most significant formal gardens created in recent years. Laid out as a series of interlocking hedged rooms. It's a showcase for Sir Roy's monuments and artifacts that he collected over the years as an art historian. The garden has statue line walks, small buildings, fountains, and much, much more, but very few flowers. It owes its inspiration to many sources, including the arts and crafts garden. And as some of you probably know, Sir Roy has just turned his uh, famous house and garden, the last get over to a gardens organization. So it should be open to the public shortly. And then Brian's ground, which is a new garden that was created around a 1913 arts and crafts home um, house. The owners are David Wheeler, who's the editor of Hortus Magazine, and Simon Doro, who's the artist who drew all the plans that I've been showing um, in this presentation. They spent the last 25 years remaking, remodeling, and enlarging the gardens that included traditional formal garden and orchard and Arboretum and more. And this charming serpentine edged canal garden. And on the right, a former gas house that was turned into a garden folly, just one of several different episodes on the grounds. And then York Gate, which is located in a quiet uh, suburb not far from York. Remarkable for its small scale, its ingenious planting, planning and architectural detailing. And some of the hardscaping, which you can see is, is, is recycled material. It's actually a small garden. It's considered a small garden. It's two acres. Combines uh, ordered geometry with its planning and diversity of foliage and texture in planting. And then Helen Dillon's world famous former garden in uh, Dublin. She now has uh, quit this garden and has started yet another wonderful garden just north of Dublin. Expressed both her passion for combining plants for color and texture, as well as her eye for architectural detailing. In many ways, a modern day Gertrude Deco, but obviously so much more. Wollerton Old Hall, uh, located in Shropshire, is considered one of England's most famous, finest gardens, consist consisting of a series of outdoor rooms, each one more breathtaking than the last, surrounding a traditional manor house. I was absolutely stunned when I walked into this garden. I just couldn't, I just, you go into one room and you look over your shoulder and you see there's another room. It just draws you right into it. It's one of the most beautiful gardens I've ever been to. And of course, the work of Ginny Blom, a contemporary artist gardener 
responsible for a number of sensuous gardens that are uniquely hers. Um, exquisite plantings and judicious supporting features. And probably one of the most famous recent garden undertakings in America is uh, Hollister House in Northwest Connecticut, a six acre garden skillfully combining an ingenious layout, storied plantings, all based on art historian George Holcroft's visits to Hidgut, Sissinghurst, Great Dixter, and all the others. It consists of a series of parterres on a sloping terrain, each with a different focus and exhibition of planting expertise. Hollister House is, a, is an excellent example of the basic lessons of arts and crafts garden planning. And it, once again, is a preservation project of the Garden Conservancy, frequently open to the public with many programs. And last but not least, Bill Noble's informal garden in Vermont, Northern Vermont, laid out with an artist's eye for planting combination based on his years of gardening, plus exposure to some of America's finest gardens in his role as former director of preservation for the Garden Conservancy. Bill has a new book out that explains how we, how we put it all together. Well, no discussion of the arts and crafts garden is complete without mention of its most famous symbol, the Lutchen's bench, seen in gardens the world over. But it made its very first appearance at Munstead Wood in 1896, which you can see in the old country life picture on the upper left and has had many, many imitations since then. Well, in conclusion, I did say this is a brief introduction to a very complex history of the arts and crafts garden, its origins, designers, characteristics, and its influence. And it offers a highly uh, personal selection that were based on my years of many, many years of research, travel, and an extensive garden library. The book, however, reveals more themes and designers, plus it includes a list of over 100 gardens that one can visit, including dozens of National Trust properties. I'm so sorry I can't sell you copies of the book today and autograph it, but I know some of you have it. You can buy it from Timber Press and you can buy it on Amazon or from your local bookseller. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, We'll Judith, look forward to hearing from you. Judith, thank you very much. I'm blown away. It was such a wonderful presentation. Um, we have a couple of, the first question was how do, how, do, how do I buy your book? And that came in many times. So it, that book and other books are all available on Amazon? Yes, yes they are. Um, I think I sent a link the other day, but you may not have gotten it. With, you can order it directly from uh, Timber Press. Fantastic. Um, and another, uh, we've got a, a multiple requests. If there's a possibility that you could create an inventory of the projects uh, but that, we, that we saw and where they're from so that maybe we could leave it as an attachment with this, uh, with this video after it's uh, up online so that they'd like to know what they just saw. Okay, a slide list. Yes, I can certainly do that. Fantastic. Another question, um, are most of these photos in your book? They all come from the book, Fantastic. plus many, many more. I had a very hard time narrowing it all down. Um, is there a book or an exhibition catalog that you know of that bring paintings and gardens together and actually discuss that comparatively? Uh, there are, uh, you know, every few years sort of a new book comes out putting together paintings and gardens and I'd have to say if I can read it up here on uh, myself, there's a wonderful book that came out about five, hold on, five years ago. Um, called The Artist Garden, American Impressionism and the Garden Movement. Um, 
I, it was put together by the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts and it was an exhibit that went around to four or five historic uh, homes and gardens in, in the US. Came out about five years, the University of Pennsylvania. It's one of many, many books that uh, has beautiful paintings and renderings of uh, gardens. Fantastic. Um, one question was, why did the U USA appear to focus more on architecture and hard landscaping than planting? Yeah, that, that's a tricky one too. That's very, very tricky. There really aren't any so-called arts and crafts gardens in America that are comparable to any of the British ones that I showed, especially those in, in the Cotswolds. There are exceptions here and there. But since the climate and the traditions in America are so diverse, um, it can't be easily pinpointed. There is an opportunity for someone to write a wonderful book called The Gardens of the Arts and Crafts Movement in America. What, what sparked your interest in Gardens of the Arts and Crafts? What was the question? What was your what sparked your interest in the subject, the arts and the, the arts and crafts movement of gardens? Well, actually, it was that seminal trip that I took to stand and I didn't know anything about gardens. I for years, my husband and I uh, have visited uh, important arts and crafts houses all over Britain, you know, all the work of Lutzens and it wasn't I didn't know anything about gardens back then. I mean, it was completely ignorant, but Interestingly enough, we also started collecting books about British architecture, history of British architecture of the early 20th century. And I kept running across this name called Gertrude Ziegel. And uh, I realized that she wrote a number of books. So I started buying them. I never read them, but I bought them because it was so beautifully designed and had these photographs in it. It wasn't until many, many years later that I kind of connected the dots. Um, this is a great question. Um, what is the relationship between the arts and crafts movement and gardening to the Olmsted brothers? Not much. Really? There's I'm, not, a, I'm not an Olmsted scholar, but they're, they're, you know, it's like comparing apples and oranges, different, different approaches. Interesting. I mean, the Olmsted firms that came later specialized in residential planning, um, but I can't, nothing comes to mind that I would call really arts and crafts. It's very American. Um, one question is, do you have examples of UK arts and crafts architects being influenced by US architects and landscape architects working in the same period? Oh, that's a great question. And I don't really have an answer. Um, we always think of the influence washing from Britain to America, but um, I can't put my finger on something coming the other way. The only people that were really, that might have been well known with the Green and Green Brothers from California. And as I said, I, I was amazed that they were exact same age as Jimson and the Barnsley. So they were kind of working at the same point. And back in the old days, the architects read, you know, all these periodicals and books, and they knew all about Boise just from reading periodicals. And they'd travel to England to uh, see some of these treasures. But whether it happened the other way, that, that's a good topic for somebody. Um, here's another good one for you. Um... Given your extensive knowledge, what would you say is the quintessential recipe for an arts and crafts garden? What is the perfect? The, what would be the recipe, the quintessential recipe for an arts and crafts garden? Well, there really isn't a recipe for the arts and crafts garden. It, it, it's really just an approach. The garden should relate to the house. It shouldn't be too complex. Um, it, should, it should reflect regional uh, materials and stonework. Uh, in other words, it shouldn't have any fancy European um, elements in it, no Renaissance statuary. It all should be 
focused on the arts and crafts, but the most important thing is you think of the arts and crafts garden as an outdoor room, an extension to the house. Excellent. Where would you place Beatrice Ferrand? That, that should be the next lecture, I think. Uh, <laughs> well, you're hired. Um, well, Beatrix is Beatrix. Um, she had many different influences and obviously she was influenced by Goethe Jekyll. I think we can see in her early work that she was looking at, uh, and this would be from the early 1900s when she was just getting started. She was looking at smaller residential gardens. This was long before she had her big commissions for uh, Dumbarton Oaks and Abbey Aldrich Rockefeller. We're looking at smaller projects that she had, I think Belfield, which is uh, located at, uh, up the Hudson, uh, part of the FDR National Historic Site, um, is a uh, restored uh, Farron garden. It fits more into the arts and crafts era than others. It's open to the public. If I did a lecture on Farron, I'd tell you all about it, but that's a good one, Belfield. What about the influ the influence of Italian gardens in books by Platt and Wharton? I would say they have nothing whatsoever to do with the arts and crafts movement. Okay. Uh, so I have a, a a comment or a question I'd like to know your thoughts on. I have this. I've been think studying um, the picturesque movement in sort of the 17, 1800s, and I have this philosophy that there was the rejection of classicism at this moment and actually spurned everything that, we're, that we saw in the next 200, 200 years, including art movements like the Hudson River School, which were basically strong commentaries on society and rejection of in, industrial movement and appreciation of place. And I'm wondering if you see that same tie or whether I'm hallucinating. So I, I'd love, I'd like your thoughts on that. Yeah, that's a little difficult. Um, you know, that, that's a set piece all in itself. I think the important thing about the arts and crafts garden is it's residential, it's small, um, it's contained. Um, it has to do with, uh, it's really, it's, it, it's, it's very difficult to, to describe what the arts and crafts garden is and what, what the influences are. But it's more a reverence for local materials, local traditions, uh, simplicity, getting away from the big stuff. It, and that's sort of exactly how I also may make analogies to the, the, the food movement that has occurred over the last, the natural food movement over the last 33 decades, which has changed the world, um, almost a similar thing of appreciation, or, or, or an appreciation of where you are and what local materials, local labor, it all sort of seems like a building process. Um, anyway, thank you. So I have another question, which is, um, what about the extent of uh, Parisian influence in the aesthetic? Uh, one sees the inclusion of peacocks in design um, and the lusciousness of the, in the lusciousness of the plantings. Uh, can you run that by me again? Uh, to, Total complex. <laughs> to, to what extent is there per, per, Persian influence, not Parisian, per, per, Persian. Per, Persian influence in the aesthetic? One sees inclusion of peacocks in the design, e.g. and the lusciousness of the plantings. I don't see the connection between Persian design and English arts and crafts movement. However, um, perhaps the person is thinking about uh, the great potter, uh, William de Morgan, who, who did beautiful oriental inspired uh, ceramics that were part of the whole Morris, Morris and Company scene. But as far as having any influence on garden design, I would say no. I think when I think of Persian or 
influence. I think of tiles, I think of Cal Southern California. Arts and crafts is much more homey, much more uh, down to earth, with no, no continental uh, influences. Interesting. Um, do you have a, you have a favorite garden that you visited in England? I probably have a list of about a hundred. Uh, <laughs> That's what you'll be preparing for us. <laughs> uh, there are a couple of them that I'd like to go back to every now and then and check on just because they're wonderful places to visit. Um, and I'd rank them among my top favorites. And one would be Gravetime Manor. Uh, I love going there. I love seeing, learning about the history of the property. And it, it, it helps a lot that it's a very famous Relay a Chateau uh, place to say. So it's a, it's a, my husband and I spent our 50th wedding anniversary there in last December, not knowing that that was our last trip abroad. Uh, the other place that I love to check in, Anna, is Hester Coombe. It has such a wonderful, rich history. Not only does it have this magnificent Lutyens and Jigo Garden and all sorts of things that keep, keep finding these crazy details that Lutyens did in the steps and what, but it has this incredible 18th century woodland garden that they recently restored in the last 10 years. So um, it gives us a little bit of, of history there. I'd have to say those are the two that two out of 500 that uh, I love to visit and keep up with. Um, Filoli, California, does that have an arts and craft influence? Does California have it? Filoli, is it Filoli, F-I- Oh, Filoli, no, that's more, that's more sort of country house era. It's a beautiful garden, but it's a little bit too complex and a little bit too sophisticated to be arts and crafts. Uh, question is, I wonder if um, you have visited the gardens of Elizabeth Lord and Edith Shriver in the oh, Pacific Northwest. Oh, Lord and Shriver. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, that gets into my other book on Ellen Shipman. Um, yeah, uh, Edith Shriver worked for Ellen Shipman. Yeah, that's the, they were um, just in a nutshell, um, the first, uh, West, they opened the first West Coast uh, all-female landscape architecture firm. And they did uh, a lot of work in uh, Salem, Oregon and the uh, in that whole area there. I wouldn't say that they were arts and crafts. They trained in the 1920s and 1930s and uh, their heyday was up until the early 1950s. But remarkable, uh, beautiful gardens they designed small residential gardens. Would you consider Catherine Swift's garden at Morville Hall a modern impl implementation of the arts and crafts movement? Catherine Swift. Yeah. Oh, I oh I oh I know who you mean, right? Yes, I actually visited that. But yes, and she wrote a delightful book on uh, Morville Hall. Um, in some ways, but. It's a garden of rooms and it's a garden of a dedicated plants when, uh, plants woman um, who knows her history. Whether it's arts and crafts would be difficult to slot it there. I mean, there are so many wonderful gardens throughout Britain um, that if you look at it through an arts and crafts eye, you'd say maybe that is arts and crafts, but really arts and crafts gardens were created mainly by architects and over a very short period of time. Um, are American gardens of the arts and crafts movement protected in the same way the National Trust protects the UK gardens? That's a general question, I guess. Yeah, that, that's, that's, I'm not really the expert on that. I mean, obviously in Britain, you have the National trust, but uh, in America, we don't have one big organization that's an uh, umbrella, and that could be a plus or a minus, but we have other organizations, local organizations that look after places. Of course, without 
continuing to mention them. We have the Garden Conservancy that uh, has a number of preservation projects, 10 or 12 of them or so that they've done over the years where they've uh, uh, consulted with, uh, well, Green Gables, for instance, was a preservation project. They worked with the owners acquiring the easements and tried to guide them. But as far as being a governmental or organization that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not the same. We have here, of course, the National Park Service that is custodian to many, many hundreds of famous, uh, you know, properties, including gardens. So it's a little bit different. It's like comparing apples and oranges, but no, there's no big umbrella organization like the National Trust in Britain. Thank you. Um, given the love of get, given the love of nature, the ridge topiary are surprises. Do you have a comment? The topiaries? Yeah, I, I it says the given the love of nature, the ridge topiary are surprises. And do you have a comment on that? I don't understand the question, but I don't. Well, it's hard for to understand how we were looking at two different viewpoints. We're looking at William Robinson, who hated topiaries and called them clipped, you know, vegetables, clippings, whatever he called it. Uh, the topiary is just an element that comes in arts and crafts gardens. And then with William Robinson, you have an approach of looking at more native plants to do the plantings. Robinson himself was not really an arts and crafts garden designer. As I said, he was an uh, expert on plants and uh, provided a lot of information on plants, but he was not a garden designer for sure, and he hated topiary. We'll take a few more questions if that's okay. okay. Um, any view on the garden of Newman College, Cambridge, arts and crafts building and garden? Oh, I wish I knew more about that. Um, I'd have to say I can't answer that question because I, I haven't been to Newnham College. I've heard, I know there's a little book that maybe Jane Brown, somebody wrote about the, the, the garden there a number of years ago. Do you think that the contemporary makeovers of arts and crafts planting, e.g. Folly Farm, detract from the original creative intent of the gardens? Yeah, that's a deep philosophical question whether the, the garden, a garden that was designed over a hundred years ago should continue as, to continue as it is or whether it should be refreshed or whether it should be a new garden. I mean, they're all different approaches to garden. And that's a huge topic about garden restoration and whether to, do a paint by numbers uh, thing. I think the owners at Folly Farm who were very private treasured the fact that they had this incredible Lutchins and Jiggle garden. And there was no question that they would wipe that away and put in something new. And they made the commitment to um, asking, you know, a renowned landscape architect and garden designer, Dan Pearson to help them uh, uh, restore the gardens, but that's not the path that a lot of people can uh, can take. It, it, we have the same issue in architecture: is that when you do you readapt a building to technology in the spirit of the original architect's uh, party, or do you memorialize it and keep it frozen? Um, it's and I'm sure it's different for every circumstance, but um, it's, it's different. For, yeah, you're right. It's different for every uh, circumstance. You certainly, certainly can do a new garden that's inspired by the old, but just a uh, planting by numbers, take it out of a book thing. That 
that doesn't seem relevant today unless it's a historic house and garden where you need to have the, the garden go with the house. Well, th thank you so much, Judith. This was just absolutely wonderful. I, I hope that uh, you, you join us again for part two. We'll come no, up with I'd, it. I'd love to. Fantastic. And thank you everybody from all over the world who signed up and joined us today. Um, this was wonderful. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.